The Black Man, His Genius and His Achievements, Benjamin Banneker. The services rendered to science, to liberty, and to the intellectual character of the Negro by Banneker are too great for us to allow his name to sleep and his genius and merits to remain hidden from the world. Benjamin Banneker was born in the state of Maryland in the year 1732 of pure African parentage, their blood never having been corrupted by the introduction of a drop of Anglo-Saxon. His father was a slave and of course could do nothing towards the education of the child. The mother, however, being free, succeeded in purchasing the freedom of her husband, and they, with their son, settled on a few acres of land where Benjamin remained during the lifetime of his parents. His entire schooling was gained from an obscure country school established for the education of children of free Negroes. And these advantages were poor, for the boy appears to have finished studying before he arrived at his 15th year. Although out of school, Banneker was still a student and read with great care and attention such books as he could get. Mr. George Ellicott, a gentleman of fortune and considerable literary taste and who resided near to Benjamin, became interested in him and lent him books from his large library. Among these books were Mayer's Tables, Ferguson's Astronomy, and Leadbeater's Lunar Tables. A few old and imperfect astronomical instruments also found their way into the boy's hands, all of which he used with great benefit to his own mind. Banneker took delight in the study of the languages and soon mastered the Latin, Greek, and German. He was also proficient in the French. The classics were not neglected by him and the general literary knowledge which he possessed caused Mr. Ellicott to regard him as the most learned man in the town and he never failed to introduce Banneker to his most distinguished guests. About this time, Benjamin turned his attention particularly to astronomy and determined on making calculations for an almanac and completed a set for the whole year. Encouraged by his attempt, he entered upon calculations for subsequent years, which as well as the former, he began and finished without the least assistance from any person or books than those already mentioned, so that whatever merit is attached to his performance is exclusively his own. He published an almanac in Philadelphia for the years 1792, 1793, 1794, and 1795 which contained his calculations exhibiting the different aspects of the planets, a table of the motions of the sun and moon, their risings and settings, and the courses of the bodies of the planetary system. By this time, Banneker's acquirements had become generally known, and the best scholars in the country opened correspondence with him. Goddard and Angel, the well-known Baltimore publishers, engaged his pen for their establishment and became the publishers of his almanacs. A copy of his first production was sent to Thomas Jefferson, together with a letter intended to interest the great statesman in the cause of Negro emancipation and the elevation of the race, in which he says, It is a truth too well attested to need a proof here that we are a race of beings who have long labored under the abuse and censure of the world, that we have long been looked upon with an eye of contempt and considered rather as brutish than human, 
and scarcely capable of mental endowments. I hope I may safely admit in the consequence of the report which has reached me that you are a man far less inflexible in sentiments of this nature than many others, that you are measurably friendly and well disposed towards us, and that you are willing to lend your aid and assistance for our relief from those many distresses and numerous calamities to which we are reduced. If this is founded in truth, I apprehend you will embrace every opportunity to eradicate that train of absurd and false ideas and opinions which so generally prevail with respect to us and that your sentiments are concurrent with mine, which are that one universal Father hath given being to us all, that he hath not only made us all of one flesh, but that he hath also without partiality afforded us all the same sensations and endowed us all with the same faculties and that however variable we may be in society or religion however diversified in situation or in color we are all of the same family and stand in the same relation to him if these are sentiments of which you are fully persuaded you cannot but acknowledge that it is the indispensable duty of those who maintain the rights of human nature and who profess the obligations of Christianity to extend their power and influence to the relief of every part of the human race from whatever burden or oppression they may unjustly labor under. And this, I apprehend, a full conviction of the truth and obligation of these principles should lead all to. I have long been convinced that if your love for yourselves and for those inestimable laws which preserve to you the rights of human nature was founded on sincerity, you could not but be solicitous that every individual of whatever rank or distinction might with you equally enjoy the blessings thereof. Neither could you rest satisfied short of the most active effusion of your exertions in order to effect their promotion from any state of degradation to which the unjustifiable cruelty and barbarism of men may have reduced them. I freely and cheerfully acknowledge that I am one of the African race and in that color which is natural to them of the deepest dye. And it is under a sense of the most profound gratitude to the supreme ruler of the universe that I now confess to you that I am not under that state of tyrannical thraldom and inhuman captivity to which too many of my brethren are doomed, but that I have abundantly tasted of the fruition of those blessings which proceed from that free and unequaled liberty with which you are favored and which I hope you will willingly allow you have mercifully received from the immediate hand of that being from whom proceedeth every good and perfect gift. Your knowledge of the situation of my brethren is too extensive to need a recital here. Neither shall I presume to prescribe methods by which they may be relieved. Otherwise, than by recommending to you and to others to wean yourselves from those narrow prejudices which you have imbibed with respect to them. And, as Job proposed to his friends, put your soul in their soul's stead. Thus shall your hearts be enlarged with kindness and benevolence towards them. And thus shall you need neither the direction of myself or others in what manner to proceed herein. The calculation for this almanac is the production of my arduous study in my advanced stage of life, for having long had unbounded desires to become acquainted with the secrets of nature, I have had to gratify my curiosity herein through my own assiduous application to astronomical study 
in which I need not recount to you the many difficulties and disadvantages which I have had to encounter. Mr. Jefferson at once replied as follows. Philadelphia, August 30th, 1791. Sir, I thank you sincerely for your letter and the almanac it contained. Nobody wishes more than I do to see such proofs as you exhibit that nature has given to our black brethren talents equal to those of the other colors of men and that the appearance of the want of them is owing merely to the degraded condition of their existence, both in Africa and America. I can add with truth that nobody wishes more ardently to see a good system commenced for raising their condition, both of their body and their mind, to what it ought to be as far as the imbecility of their present existence and other circumstances, which cannot be neglected, will admit. I have taken the liberty of sending your almanac to Monsieur de Condorcet, Secretary of the Academy of Sciences at Paris, and a member of the Philanthropic Society, because I consider it as a document to which your whole color have a right for their justification against the doubts which have been entertained of them. I am with great esteem, dear sir, your obedient, etc., Thomas Jefferson, to Mr. B. Banneker. The letter from Banneker, together with the almanac, created in the heart of Mr. Jefferson a fresh feeling of enthusiasm in behalf of freedom, and especially for the Negro, which ceased only with his life. The American statesman wrote to Brissot, the celebrated French writer, in which he made enthusiastic mention of the Negro philosopher. At the formation of the Society of the Friends of the Blacks at Paris by Lafayette, Brissot, Barnave, Condorcet, and Gregor, the name of Banneker was again and again referred to to prove the equality of the races. Indeed, the genius of the Negro philosopher did much towards giving liberty to the people of St. Domingo. In the British House of Commons, Pitt, Wilberforce, and Buxton often alluded to Banneker by name as a man fit to fill any position in society. At the setting off of the District of Columbia for the capital of the federal government, Banneker was invited by the Maryland commissioners and took an honorable part in the settlement of the territory. But throughout all his intercourse with men of influence, he never lost sight of the condition of his race and ever urged the emancipation and elevation of the slave. He well knew that everything that was founded upon the admitted inferiority of natural right in the African was calculated to degrade him and bring him nearer to the foot of the oppressor. And he therefore never failed to allude to the equality of the races when with those whites whom he could influence. He always urged self-elevation upon the colored people whom he met. He felt that to deprive the black man of the inspiration of ambition, of hope, of health, of standing among his brethren of the earth, was to take from him all incentives to mental improvement. What husbandman incurs the toil of seed time and culture, except with a view to the subsequent enjoyment of a golden harvest? Banneker was endowed by nature with all those excellent qualifications which are necessary previous to the accomplishment of a great man. His memory was large and tenacious, yet by a curious felicity chiefly susceptible of the finest impressions it received from the best authors he read, which he always preserved in their primitive strength and amiable order. 
He had a quickness of apprehension and a vivacity of understanding, which easily took in and surmounted the most subtle and knotty parts of mathematics and metaphysics. He possessed in a large degree that genius which constitutes a man of letters, that quality without which judgment is cold and knowledge is inert, that energy which collects, combines, amplifies, and animates. He knew every branch of history, both natural and civil. He had read all the original historians of England, France, and Germany, and was a great antiquarian. Criticism, metaphysics, morals, politics, voyages, and travels were all studied and well digested by him. With such a fund of knowledge, his conversation was equally interesting, instructive, and entertaining. Banneker was so favorably appreciated by the first families in Virginia that in 1803, he was invited by Mr. Jefferson, then President of the United States, to visit him at Monticello, where the statesmen had gone for recreation. But he was too infirm to undertake the journey. He died the following year, aged 72. Like the golden sun that has sunk beneath the western horizon, but still throws upon the world, which he sustained and enlightened in his career, the reflected beams of his departed genius, his name can only perish with his language. Banneker believed in the divinity of reason and in the omnipotence of the human understanding with liberty for its handmaid. The intellect impregnated by science and multiplied by time, it appeared to him, must triumph necessarily over all the resistance of matter. He had faith in liberty, truth, and virtue. His remains still rest in the slave state where he lived and died, with no stone to mark the spot or tell that it is the grave of Benjamin Banneker. He labored incessantly, lived irreproachably, and died in the literary harness, universally esteemed and regretted.